Okay, Lucy, so you, you've published a really interesting book, Blockbuster, about Fergus Hume and the mystery of the Hansom Cab. What was it that drew you to Fergus Hume in the first place? Well, I was, I come from New Zealand. I was born in Christchurch, New Zealand, and now I'm Marsh's hometown. But I'd never actually heard of Fergus Hume until I was doing some research for Stephen Knight. It was a crime fiction story, and he said, oh, there's this novel that was an international bestseller. And, um, and it was set in Melbourne in the 1880s, and it came out before Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And I subsequently went, did some work for another, another academic, Meg Tasker, um, on Australians in, the, in London, working as writers and journalists in the late turn of, turn of last century. And Hume was there too. So I had a file on Hume, which I kept adding to, along with a lot of other writers like Henry Lawson. And one day it was basically digitised newspapers were just starting to take off. So you had Trove, but you had Papers Past, which was in New Zealand. And I just had a couple of hours which was spare, and I thought, now let's see what's up, up what I can find about Hume using these digitised resources and so, oh boy. Um, so you could actually start in Australia, get a lead, follow up to New Zealand and then go back. So I was crossing the Tasman about half a dozen times and then went to the Times archive and other English archives. At the end of those two hours I knew that I had a book because the story behind this um, novel, The Handsome Cab, was just such a microcosm of 19th century Melbourne and book production. And in fact, it was the, round about the time it was published, the author was living diagonally across from this um, library in George Street. So the building is no longer there, but his ghost you know, maybe sort of haunts the, haunts the place. It's, it's interesting, as you say, it was an absolutely sensational publishing event, not just in Melbourne, but all over the world. Why was it, you think, that particularly London and England took such an interest in a book about Melbourne in the 1880s? They were pretty much primed for sensation novels about interesting cities. So um, there was like Gaborio had written, who was Emil Gaborio, who was the most, who was Fergus Hume's model, had written about Paris. And Melbourne at the time was the largest and richest city in the Southern Hemisphere. And there was a lot of interest. There was, it was more like Sydney than anything else. It was capitalist mecca and fortunes are being lost and won and but there was also this it was a very new society and a lot of people had come here and left their pasts behind bigamists for instance so bigamy was rife and so people could actually come to melbourne build up quite a respectable reputation become leaders of society not knowing whether their past might arrive on the next boat from England so it was kind of an edifice built on sand which might collapse at any moment so and Hume being an outsider he'd come from New Zealand to make his fortune in the theatre and finding it a bit hard to break in he thought oh I'll write a novel and um, and goes to a bookseller and says oh what's selling and they said oh a Gaborio so he buys 10 Gaborios goes home reads them and thinks Okay, so um, you have a setting, and then you have to have a murder, and then you have to have the investigation of this murder, and you have to have lots and lots of local colour, and he sat down and wrote it. And he had quite a good product, but it was just a little bit naughty because there was you know, bigamy, um, illegitimacy, opium dens in Little Collins Street, um, and so he couldn't get it published. And as a result, um, he self-published, um, probably after speculating on mining, um, because this was 1885, and when the book came out, was when BHP, um, and he had a friend working in the mining area. So he, he semi-self-published, and he had an absolute brilliant associate called Fred Trishler, who understood marketing. And so Fred Trishler had Hume driving around Melbourne in a hansom cab and a banner advertising the, the cab because it was a murder in a hansom cab. And they'd very neatly timed it to come out at a verse of Melbourne Cup when the city had city's population exploded. And I would bet you anything they were selling copies of the Melbourne Cup and what did they have on the cover but a horse. 
So it is said to have sold out very quickly um, in Melbourne. And then Fred Trishler thought, oh, well, I'll try this in London and found a financial backer who turned out to be very sh shady indeed, a banker who defrauded his bank and Fred Trishler took the handsome cab to Melbourne and published something like thousands of copies a month for months and months and months until they got something like 500,000 copies, which was unprecedented in that short time for a crime thriller. And, and, and Fergus Hume himself though, didn't do all that well out of the London part of the operation. Yeah, Paul Fergus, he believed that it, he was still focused on being a dramatist and he thought that, well, um, I can't see that the logo, that it would be a success in London, but you know, Fred Trishel was willing to try. So he sold his copyright for £50, which sounds small to us, but it was actually a very large amount of money. Uh, but not what, it, what the book in fact made in England, which would have set him up for the rest of his life. And we know that he wrote at least two other books that are set in Australia. How did they go? Um, Madame Midas was about his friend, the mining, the mining, uh, who was a mining magnate, Alice Cornwall, and she was like the 19th century equivalent of Gina Reinhardt. And she went to England, and she was very successful. Float. She was a, a, a really pioneering um, mining entrepreneur. So he wrote a book about her, again set in Melbourne, and that's been reprinted. Um, but the third one is Miss Mistopheles, which is about the theatre, and that hasn't been reprinted. Uh, he wrote these three books, and he went to England, and he never went to Australia again. But with those three books, he left a fairly unforgettable picture of what Melbourne was like in its boomtown mm. era. And when he moved to London, he was then writing mostly about London and UK oh, yeah. settings. And they didn't turn out to be so successful. Um, it, he got it right the first time. Mm. Some people do that. And, but he was stuck in a groove. He couldn't break into the English theatre either. So he was stuck with writing crime thrillers, some of which were very good, some of which were very workaday. And he, he did 140 of them. And um, the, could you just explain to me what the nub of the handsome cab is? Why is it a, a good place to have a, a murder mystery set around it? Well, this is the original cover. Um, and the thing about a handsome cab, which Hume realised as he was going to a sw swell party in St Kilda, is that the driver is actually outside the cabin at the back, so he can't see what's going on inside the cabin. Um, and so the and people would communicate with him through a trapdoor. So, so it would be possible to have an assignation or it would be possible to murder somebody on a dark night with nobody being the wiser. And Hume's other, in a, other notion was that, that all men in evening dress look the same. So, oh, he just wore evening dress. It's like the disguising power of the uniform. So even now, if you happen to be dressed up as a policeman and you commit a murder, people are just going to say, a hey, policeman without being able to look beyond the uniform. Mm. So. And he describes a whole lot of locations in Melbourne. You follow the handsome cab on a route through Melbourne. Is much of Hume's Melbourne still in existence? Well, the actual site outside Scott's Church is, but not the Burke and Wills statue, which was moved down the hill because they were installing trams that, that the year after. But you can walk through Carlton um, and you can still see an awful lot of Hume's Melbourne. The Princess Theatre was there, Houses of Parliament. In fact, if you walk across the Fitzroy Gardens, you're following directly his route that he took every day between his job in a law office or when he was going to the theatre. And in fact, the route described by the police are shadowing the suspect across Fitzroy Gardens. So there's a lot of it. There's a lot of the setting of the book still here, despite... You know, huge changes, skyscrapers and all the rest. And so the event that we're doing in Red Book we, in this year is to pick up on some of those uh, surviving bits of Melbourne mm. and to walk people through that part of Hughes Melbourne. Yeah, follow, follow, follow the path he took. Uh, Sisters in Crime was followed, was followed as initially as an imitation of a US organisation also called Sisters in Crime, which was like a support group for crime writers. The difference between Sisters in Crime Melbourne, it, well, it's largely in Melbourne, there are a few branches, 
um, is that it's fans and it's um, also writers, particularly beginning writers, so that it was open to people who were not professionals. It's similar to the models of science fiction conventions. And so Sisters in Crime was quite an important staging place for a number of writers who were just starting their career. So they could start by um, applying their skills to writing short stories of the Scarlet Stiletto Awards, and that's produced a number of people. Um, and then also there's the awards um, for books published, so that there's True Crime and the Ellen Davitt Award, which is for writing a crime book. And this is actually written after, named after Ellen Davitt, who was the um, first woman, first author of the first murder mystery published in Australia in 1865, which was serialised in the Australian Journal. So it's a serialised novel that begins with a, um, begins with a murder and ends with its solution. And it never appeared in book form, but it's an almost perfect arc of the crime story model as it was to be. It's interesting. Do, do you think it's uh, easier now or harder for women to get published as crime authors than it was in the 1860s? I don't necessarily think it was hard for women to be crime writers because it was, I've, I mean, I've written a book on this, but this is my PhD thesis, and there, for every um, major crime author, there's an equivalent woman who's doing as well, if not better. So, um, Wilkie Collins, there was Mary, Mary Braddon um, for um, Conan Doyle, there was Anna Catherine Green, who was a best-selling American writer the Leavenworth case, and even going back to Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, who supposedly kicked it all off, you've got a woman called Catherine Crowe who had a novel called Susan Hopley or Circumstantial Evidence that actually featured a maidservant and two other female detectives. And it's, apart from the form being episodic, it's again a murder mystery. But this was out um, like a few months before uh, the murders in the room walk, so it goes back quite a way. Uh, in fact, if you look at the so called golden age of crime fiction writing in the period between the First and Second World War, many of the major crime writers internationally were women. What is it that women do you think women bring a particular point of view to crime writing that makes them successful? I think that women are just interested in crime, and the 19th century writers, as far as I could establish generally had some connection with crime. Um, Ellen Davitt was the daughter of a man who committed bank fraud. Um, Mary Fortune, who was the major short story writer of crime and living in Melbourne, wrote 500 crime stories. Um, she was the bigamous wife of a policeman and her son was a career criminal, so it really helps if you've got some direct connection with crime. Um, but I think that it's a very basic instinct to look at crime, and you could follow the crimes in the newspaper so that even if you weren't directly involved, um, you could gain an understanding of how the crime, what, how crime could be realistically portrayed.